What's going on guys? Today I wanted to focus on picking the right data pipeline tool. Uh, in particular, I wanted to look at Airflow versus Luigi. This will be a video series where I look at Airflow and Luigi first, just from a very high level, and then we're eventually going to kind of go into the actual code. In this part one, we're really going to focus on the various components that make up Airflow and Luigi and kind of where they fit, as well as trying to answer the question why we use these tools in the first place. You know, why don't we just create custom solutions? And then in future videos, I will kind of go into Airflow and Luigi uh, on a code level where we try to actually build some pipelines. This is definitely a start of a new series where I try to compare different tooling. Uh, in this case, it's Airflow versus Luigi, but in the future, I'm also looking at things like Databricks, Snowflake, um, and some other components to try to help you guys either make the right choices or understand some of the differences that underlie these various data infrastructure components that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's kind of go into Airflow. Just as an agenda, this is kind of the goal of this video. The example will be in the next period. So at the very end, you see an example of setting up a Luigi task. I'll do that uh, in the next part. But for this one, we're gonna really focus on, you know, why are we using Airflow and Luigi? You know, what's the goal? Why are people looking at them? Um, some of the, the high-level components and things like that. Okay, so what are the use cases, first of all, when people talk about things like Airflow and Luigi, why are people using them? Um, in general, you can think about it from a high level. It's all about process automation. It's all about figuring out how to uh, automate different workflows. Overall, I think a lot of the articles you will read about these tools are referring to data pipelines because really that's what they were developed to be in many ways. Both Airflow and Luigi were kind of developed to help two different companies manage their data pipelines. Um, so that's why you see ELTs versus ETLs. Uh, I also see a lot of people do batch ML jobs. So batch ML being machine learning. So some people might do their uh, model once every hour or once every day, because maybe whatever they're trying to calculate doesn't need to be uh, live for some reason. So that can often fit as well in something like Airflow, where you just have the model uh, packaged in one of the steps. And uh, then just general automation. So you can think about this just, you know, generally speaking, you might just need to automate some tasks that you have that have nothing to do with data. So all of these are very valid use cases in terms of what you could use these two libraries and frameworks for. An important question to ask yourself is why not just code it yourself? Uh, you know, a lot of people might feel like they can just build up their own uh, ETL framework. And there's a couple of reasons I would say you shouldn't. One, if you don't actually decide to develop a ETL framework and just decide to put together a bunch of scripts, you're going to have what you kind of see in the screen uh, in front of you, which is this weird contraption of cron combined with maybe some PowerShell or some bash and some Python and maybe some sort of config file, all of which is very messy and not not really sustainable, especially when you start looking at companies that have hundreds, if not thousands of data pipelines, forcing them to rely on this kind of system would be unsustainable. This becomes very hairy very quickly and poses a lot of different challenges. For those of you who have never set up kind of cron jobs where you have like one set at 12 and then you think the task is going to take two hours. So you set the next uh, task three hours away from that task and you just keep having to kind of guess how many um, hours are away from each task. It's really a bad way of designing things and is just asking for things to fail. So generally speaking, I've always seen that data pipelines fail at some point, whether something changes upstream. And so now you've got something where a dependency changes. And so a, a current pipeline that's been running forever fails and then the dependency tasks fail, but you wouldn't really know it because you have no monitoring. And because there's no dependency management, you also lack the ability to like stop tasks if something fails. And so there's just a lot of problems and this becomes a cluster very quickly. Really the goal is to have this kind of classic ETL solution where you've got clear tasks kind of chunked out and each one should run in a specific order. In this case, you know, I've got task A, and task C should run before task B, task B should run before task D, and so on. And that's kind of the way you want it. You wanna make sure that things run in order and you wanna make sure they don't run before the previous task finishes. So what will end up happening essentially is if you do try to do this yourself, what you will find is you'll essentially just recreate the wheel. You'll just remake very similar components to what things like Airflow have, which we'll talk about here shortly. But the point is, you know, this is kind of the goal. We wanna have this very clear and defined what we call DAG, uh, directed acyclic graph, so where you have tasks that kind of depend on each other and only run once the previous task is run. Okay, so from a high level, when we look at Airflow versus Luigi, uh, Airflow and Luigi, again, were both developed by two different companies, uh, Airflow, Airbnb, Luigi was developed by Spotify, and both were really developed to manage all these various big data flows. Again, when you think about it, these companies probably have hundreds, if not thousands of data pipelines, and managing them manually or through some sort of weird mishmash of different code would not be sustainable, especially for companies that really rely on data like Airbnb and Spotify to make all of their decisions. The one very big difference that you'll see as we go through is Airflow, I think, is more of what I call like a configuration code style where often you have these things called operators which act as kind of the main thing that develops a task. And then from that there, you're just defining various variables in that task and you really aren't doing a lot of coding. Whereas Luigi tends to be a little more code heavy, you tend to have this class that 
acts as your task. And then from there you have various methods and functions that you're going to kind of develop around that, that are basically the requires and the output and the various steps along the way. So in order to understand the various differences, we need to understand kind of the high level components that make up Airflow versus what make up Luigi. So when we look at Airflow, there are four. So when we look at Airflow, there's at least four kind of components I like to think about. Um, or at least not necessarily components because dependency management is not really a component, but it's a very, I think, key aspect uh, of Airflow just because of the fact that most solutions don't always have this. First, we have the scheduler, which acts as the component that manages when jobs should run. Uh, you basically in Airflow can set very similar to cron statements where you can tell it to run daily or hourly based on whatever you provide it. Uh, and scheduler will kind of take care of making sure things run at the same time at the right time as well as manage things like dependencies. And that leads us to point two, which is dependency management. Again, that's less of a component and just more of an important thing I think to point out, which is you can very easily set up uh, dependency management. So what tasks should run before what task essentially. From there, there is a metadata database. Essentially Airflow uses some sort of database, whether it be SQLite, PostgreSQL, uh, MySQL, you can kind of choose which one you decide to use. And that's what's used to manage all of the various kind of components in the DAG and, and keeps track of all the information. And if you really want to read more about what goes on in the metadata database, uh, astronomer.io has a great article. In particular, I like their ERD diagram. So you can actually look into things like what is tracked in the metadata database. So things like uh, the task instances, uh, when they've started, things like that. All that information is tracked and you can kind of figure out what's going on here. And they really cover it in pretty good detail. So you'll have a good understanding of exactly what's going on. They even kind of break down the various 30 tables here. Again, as far as documentation goes, I think astronomer.io has done a great job at making Airflow really easy. Now, finally, there's the executor. And this, you have a few different options as far as how the executor operates. But overall, it essentially just tells how the tasks should run in terms of the fact that like, do you have things running in parallel or across different machines, things like that. There really is a lot of different ways you can set this component up, whether you're using something like the sequential executor or the local executor, and it really can get very complex. And this is where you start thinking more about scaling out your solution and how you actually want it to run on your infrastructure, not just on your local EC2 instance. Besides those high level components, there's some key concepts that you need to understand when working with Airflow. One, first of all, is the operators. Operators are these generalized components that act to perform some specific action. So you might have like a Python operator that's meant to call a Python function or a bash operator that does the same. You might have some sort of big table or big query operator that's meant to either insert or select data from big query. And it's very typically clearly defined in the name of what the operator is. So it's usually like Python operator clearly defining Python operator. Similarly, from those operators, you build tasks. So tasks are essentially just what you're trying to do in that operator. You can you essentially, it, once you've instantiated that operator, that's when it kind of becomes a task. And then you use those tasks to build up what we call a DAG, so a directed acyclic graph, essentially just a bunch of tasks put together, organized, that all kind of depend on various components and various uh, other tasks to finish. So, and that's what we call a DAG. Some people might call that the specific data pipeline. Some people might call the whole end-to-end -end solution the data pipeline. But overall, a DAG is just, again, a group of tasks that kind of depend on each other in some way or another. From there, you can also have things like sensors, which basically typically are waiting for some sort of file externally to load or some sort of data to come into play. So it's basically some sort of listener, essentially, you can think about it. It's waiting for something to happen that might exist outside of the task that will then kick off the task later on. So it's some sort of dependency, typically, that you're waiting for. Hooks can essentially create some sort of interface with some sort of external system. Basically, you can store things like sensitive connections very easily and just reference them later on in the future. And similarly, XCOMS, which is different, but has this weird ability to actually go across tasks. On a similar note, XCOMS are, are essentially variables that you can kind of pass through different tasks. This is kind of important to note because let's say you pull in data using one of the BigQuery operators. You can't necessarily access the data there and start manipulating things and doing and making dynamic decisions based off that data. It's kind of stored in that task and it's very difficult to access from other tasks. And that's kind of XCOMS can play this role where you can kind of do some pushing and pulling with variables. Again, there's some limits here, but it's the one way you can actually push and pull different variables across different tasks that tend to be very isolated. So if we are to look at a general uh, Airflow DAG, this is kind of a good way of thinking about it. You might have some sort of sensor waiting for some sort of file to load. And then from there, you know, that file sensor might exist in DAG A. And once that file is kind of comes into existence, it'll kick off DAG A. And then it might run through, you know, file sensor, task A, task B, uh, whatever those operators might be. And then from there, you might have a task sensor in your next DAG that basically is waiting for task B to finish, and then we'll kick off this next DAG. And so that's kind of how these pipelines work, where they're, you know, you could have tons and tons of dependencies. It can obviously become very complex and you can 
end up accidentally creating some sort of circular logic, but this is the general landscape of how it looks like, how you could think of it from a very high level. So from a high level kind of component standpoint, Luigi doesn't have as much, I think, going on as Airflow. Uh, you've got a central scheduler, which doesn't really do the same thing that Airflows does. In this case, the central scheduler really makes sure that none of the actual tasks are running at the same time. So if you've got two tasks, they are, they're not the same, right? You don't have task A and task A running uh, twice. And that's kind of one goal of the central scheduler. The other thing is to provide kind of a visual uh, representation of what's going on in terms of, you know, what task is your pipeline on. Generally speaking, uh, if you want to manage Luigi, you're going to have to use something like cron in order to manage when things are kicked off. There's also not as much logging. So Airflow has a good amount of logging that I personally like. It's very easy to click in. We'll kind of look at the UI here shortly, but it's very easy to click in and see what's gone wrong and, and where in the pipeline things have gone wrong. There is some sort of task history DB with Luigi, but it's a little more experimental and doesn't have, I think, as much information or as rich information as Airflow does. So Luigi also has kind of the concept of tasks, except for in this case, tasks are more like classes in the sense that you might have uh, specific methods like running or uh, output or input or required that basically define what is actually going to occur. So the run, so what code's gonna run for this task. So what's the core of this task? What is the output? So is there a file, is there data, et cetera? What is required? So basically what externally is required for this task to run, you can think about that as dependencies and so forth. So you'll just define those things in the task and that's kind of a differentiator and then from there you also will have targets which usually mean you know where you're actually sending this data to so if we look at this general flow you might have an input from a mysql table so you'll have this input uh, notion in task a and then task a will have some sort of run task where maybe it's got to do some sort of transformation on that data then it will output that data maybe to a raw file right something like an s3 bucket then task B might be waiting for that file. So it requires that task A has run before it checks uh, to see if that file exists. And then it will use the input to basically say, okay, I'm inputting this file. Now that task A has run and I required it, it's run. So let's now run my task. So maybe the, its task is to load that data into a data warehouse. And that's kind of the general flow. Again, you still have this concept of dependencies. It's just a little more code based. And let's kind of take a look at this here shortly. All right, so let's look at these two different pipelines. So first let's look at Airflow. Again, we're gonna eventually code this out, but I just wanna give you guys an example of what it looks like in Airflow versus Luigi. So if we look at it, you'll see, uh, you can kind of ignore the first top of this and just look at default args. That's really where the quote unquote DAG or pipeline starts. So this is basically the information that sets the configuration of the DAG itself. So you want to like, you want to provide it an owner just in case something goes wrong. Do you want it to depend on the past? Uh, when's it starting? Uh, do you email someone? Email on failure? These very important kind of configuration things that help automate a lot of the heavy lifting. From there, then you can define the DAG. So this is actually where we define what the DAG is and what will occur in it. So we're gonna call this DAG essentially hello world. So that's gonna kind of essentially act as its ID. We're gonna set it to the default args. So those args that we set up earlier, we're gonna set its schedule interval. So that again is very familiar for people who work with cron. And then from there, you'll notice that there are two tasks, uh, T1 and T2, T1 and T2, where you know, you've got this bash operator that runs some sort of command. You see this bash command here, where it's you know echo running bash and format hello world file. So we've got this hello world file that it's essentially going to echo. Uh, and then we also have this Python script that we're going to run. And that Python script, you're going to see that it's uh, count letters. So in the def count letters above, that's what we're calling essentially. So that's how you can kind of use the Python operator where you just have functions in other places and you might want to call them. And then from there, you also have some possible arguments that we're passing. So the input file or input path and output path. So you've got input path, output path, and that's kind of uh, used. And then you'll also notice that it's equal to the DAG. And so that's what kind of connects it all together to be equal to and set up with this specific DAG. And then at the very end, you deal with dependencies. So then task two runs and then task one runs. And so this is just a very simple DAG. Again, it, all it's really doing is just counting some letters in a file. Now, if we compare this to Luigi, we'll notice that there are a lot of differences here. Again, we've got this first task here, write a file task where we end up writing this file. So we write uh, hello world to out to this file. And so this is very similar to uh, the bash script that we ran. And you will notice that you've got this output, which is this hello world file and this def run, which is the actual task we're trying to run. So run again is the task. Uh, output is saying what's going to output. Now in class B or class count task, we've got uh, requires. And in this case, we're re requiring that we finish write a file task. So that's kind of the dependency management here. Um, unlike Airflow, where we had the uh, T1 depends on T2, sorry, T1 runs before T2. Uh, here we have the requires write a file task. And here again, you've got this run, which essentially defines what to run for this task. And in this case, again, we're kind of counting the tasks. 
and then it does an output again here. Uh, and then from there, we have this output text file. Again, this is a little less configuration focused and more code focused in, in some ways. It's still kind of configuration E since you're just trying to define three or four specific methods per task. And in this case, it actually ended up shorter than the Airflow task. So that is it for part one. So that is it for part one of this video. Uh, I'm going to continue again with this series about Airflow versus the Luigi, where we're going to kind of be doing some intro pipelines. So you guys can kind of see the differences as we're building them out and running them, as well as kind of looking at the UIs. Uh, the UIs are very different and, and really just discussing a lot more in terms of Airflow versus Luigi. Thanks so much for watching. And if you really enjoyed this video, take a moment to smash that like button and subscribe. It really does mean a lot to me. And with that, uh, I will see you guys next time. Thank you and goodbye.